If you happen to be a fan of Sonic the Hedgehog, which you should be because it's required by law, then do I have something cool to show you? It's pretty clear by now that Sonic game releases don't happen nearly as often anymore, so when it comes to community discussion, it's become pretty easy to start scraping the bottom of the barrel for talking points if we don't think outside the box a bit. So what's there to do? Seek out other interests for the sake of adding variety and flavor to our personal tastes? No, silly, it just means we gotta look even harder to find good Sonic content, duh! This brings us to a pretty overlooked aspect to the current Sonic brand. It's not an upcoming game or any other subject of vague speculation, but something that already exists and can be enjoyed right now. It took me far too long to properly read IDW's freshly relaunched Sonic the Hedgehog comic book series, but I suppose it's better late than never. This is a project likely conceived right after the fall of Archie Comics' long, weird monster of a Sonic series, considering its staff is made up almost entirely of veterans from the previous book, and I honestly couldn't be happier. I've been hoping for a more accessible Sonic comic for nearly a decade before the first book was cancelled. Archie's Sonic was never exactly a bad comic to me, just one that always seemed to be right outside the spectrum of what I usually like about Sonic. I became a Sonic fan during the early 2000s, and by that time the games had amassed an exceptional cast of characters and tons of lore. The original comic, however, began in 1993, and had much less of that to work with. It would almost immediately become its own thing, with barely any connection to the style of the games that spawned it. Princess Sally and the Freedom Fighters, who started out as a necessary group of OCs to supplement Sonic and Tails back when the games hadn't even introduced Knuckles yet, expanded into this enormous cast that defined the comic ongoing story. What started as a simple comedy series would spend over 20 years expanding in scale, resulting in one of the most fascinating and perhaps unapproachable pieces of Sonic's history. For a lot of fans, all this melodramatic craziness was the Sonic universe, and I think that's what kickstarted most of the community's reputation even before Sonic games went third party. This was one impactful comic, especially for how long it lasted, but after tons of legal shit with the series' most prolific writer, Sega decided to wash their hands and start Start fresh with a new publisher. This would result in a brand new Sonic comic with a brand new ongoing narrative, and none of the original content left from Archie's run. I'm not gonna pretend that I'll miss Sally and the gang, but that had to have been a heavy blow for longtime readers. Besides, what does an ongoing Sonic story without all these extra characters and plot lines even look like? Now that there are plenty of cast members designed by Sonic Team to fit into Sonic's canonical world, can returning writers Ian Flynn and Evan Stanley make proper use of them? Can they use these building blocks to craft an interesting yet accessible new series? I can't even believe I'm saying this, but yes! Not only has IDW Sonic been made precisely for fans of the games, but it's also one of the best Sonic stories I've ever experienced. In fact, I will say right now that this comic has far and away the best quality of writing that I think a Sonic product has ever had. For many years, what I like to call the second generation of Sonic fans had demanded a return to the more action-packed, character-driven style of storytelling from Sonic's games in the new millennium. Whereas 2017's Sonic Forces fumbled its attempt to capture that, IDW Sonic picks up the slack and delivers everything I could want from Sonic's cast in a dramatic and intense setting. The new series seems to begin immediately after the events of Sonic Forces, although with some details like Infinite and the Phantom Ruby going unmentioned. Sonic and friends are fighting off what's left of Dr. Eggman's army, but something just isn't adding up. Eggman is shortly discovered in what appears to be an amnesiac state after his previous defeat, but his minions just keep coming. It's almost as if something or someone else is pulling the strings in the background. The 12-part story that follows is a nice trip down memory lane for Sonic fans in their 20s, but the plot itself is actually not so interesting at first. It mainly feels like a retread of events from other games, and I think we all know how intrusive that can be by now. However, what is fantastic about this first arc is just how on point every character is. Ian Flynn has the most unbelievable knowledge of Sonic's lore and history, and uses that to write the cast in a way that is undeniably new, yet still totally true to what we know them to be. Sonic's personality seems ripped right out of Flynn's material from the Archie book, which is a good thing. He always seems to have fun showing off, kicking ass, and looking out for his friends, although his lighthearted demeanor is challenged constantly, which is very important. 
It kind of blows my mind just how effortlessly Flynn pulls off this kind of progression for Sonic, when recent Sonic games have just been misfiring over and over and over again. Sonic is far too commonly written as a blank slate to contain either a generic anime lead persona, or a tropey jock who spends too much time standing around and cracking one-liners instead of actually doing anything worth a damn. Sonic does tell jokes in this comic, but the reason why they work is because he gets shit done while he tells them. He doesn't stand there and celebrate the joke he just told for what feels like minutes on end. A more characteristic sense of humor is what pushes Sonic's quick-wittedness even further, rather than restricting it. It also helps that you can read Sonic's dialogue in whatever voice you want, instead of being forced to listen to an otherwise great voice actor in the most horribly miscast role of his entire career. Sonic is just damn near perfect in this, and it hasn't been since Sonic and the Black Knight that I felt the same essence of the hero that I fell in love with as a kid. He's cool, he's compassionate, and he's smart, but he also simply does not have all the answers, which is great for drama. He's free-spirited and actively chooses not to adopt roles of leadership. He does things his own way, sometimes to the inconvenience of his friends. And that's even pointed out by some of them, like Amy Rose, who is also just so perfectly handled here. Amy has historically been one of the most difficult Sonic characters to write, because like Sonic, she's often this suicidal tightrope act between two different one-dimensional stereotypes. Is she a love-starved child obsessed with chasing Sonic? Is she the mainstream media's patronizing half-baked version of a strong woman at the cost of any sense of humor or personality? personality? Both of these interpretations suck, at least in isolation, and people seem to forget just how much ass she kicked in both Sonic Adventure and Sonic Heroes. In those games, her love for Sonic was marked by an admiration for him. Very much like Tails, she wants to prove herself, and so she follows in his footsteps. At that point, her actions make her somewhat of a counterpart to Sonic. This comics version of Amy is capable, intelligent, and responsible, but also clearly in love with and inspired by Sonic. You can have it both ways. The two misunderstood extremes are balanced perfectly here, and there's even some fun development in which we learn how exhausted she is as a leader of the gang's resistance group. She does her best, but she's clearly still young and might not be cut out for this. Finally, her girlish chemistry with other cast members like Rouge and Cream is the cherry on top. I may still have a soft spot for her hilarious antics in Sonic X, but I think a case has been made here. This is the best and most developed Amy Rose has ever been. While there's less to say about Tails and Knuckles, they're pretty balanced too. Tails' resourcefulness as a boy genius is still really effective, although I'd like to see a more detailed new character arc for him, and Knuckles actually remembers the Master Emerald exists for once, so that's pretty cool. Fans of the Chaotix, Ruse, Blaze, Silver, and even Cream will find plenty to love here. They even brought back Gemeral from Sonic Advance 3, what the hell? That is just perfect! And he's one of the best characters too! There's even a few brand new original characters like Tangle and Whisper, who I instantly thought I'd dislike upon first seeing them, but no, they're fantastic! Tangle is the perfect kind of audience surrogate character, and Whisper is what Sonic Force's custom hero should have been. The amount of focus they get is perfect, and it doesn't put them in the way of the other other important players. Besides, if you want to read something that focuses even more on them, then they even have their own four-part miniseries. Awesome! Touching briefly on the quality of the artwork, well, I mean, look at it. It's almost always wonderful. Considering the multitude of artists on the project, it does take some time for the book to establish a consistent style, and some issues look clearly better than others, but it works itself out over time. My favorite interior artist has got to be Adam Bryce Thomas, with Evan Stanley's work coming in a very close second. These two know how to illustrate kinetic action through comics, which is a lot more difficult to do than you might think. These scenes are thrillingly fast-paced, and every panel flows into the next almost effortlessly. Dialogue and visuals have near-perfect synergy, which is impressive for an American comic, to say the least. If I may complain about one thing, however, I do not like how inconsistent these covers are. It's not uncommon for a cover to look inferior to the artwork within, and I wish that it were easier to maintain a smaller number of artists to give the covers a bit more cohesion. In fact, that actually did happen to an extent. Retail incentive covers for every single book in the series have been done by Natalie Fordrain, and it just boggles 
my mind that this artwork is not front and center on all of the trade graphic novels for the series. At least this new hardcover has some slick art of Sonic by Evan Stanley, who I'm sure will give the other characters the same stylistic treatment in future books. I know this is 100% just a personal nitpick of mine, but I don't read American comics very much, and I like seeing one artist's vision dominate any collection I may have. That said, the point still stands that these covers overall don't hold a candle to the best of the Archie books. And I hope to see longtime fan favorite Patrick Spaziante back at the- Oh, yep, look, there he is! Missed you, buddy. And of course, seeing input from official Sonic Team artists like Yuji Oekawa from time to time is just the greatest. It's almost unreal. Also, my friend Gigi has worked on this comic a few times, and I could not be more proud. Back to the story. Once we transition out of the series' first major arc, it becomes clear that Dr. Eggman is here to stay, and he's got a new evil plan that will kickstart what I consider to be the real beginning of this comic's ongoing story. We were just getting warmed up before this. In what we'll call the Metal Virus arc, Sonic the Hedgehog attempts what can only be described as an honest-to-god zombie apocalypse story. This sounds utterly ridiculous, but what's even crazier than that is that it's good! It's super good! There's action, there's humor, there's legitimate character drama for everyone, and Sonic himself is given a handicap that lets us look a little deeper into his personality as a hero. It is just fantastic, and even though it goes on for just a little longer than expected and ends a bit too fast, it is one of the most thrilling adventures Sonic has ever had. Definitely my personal favorite Sonic story since the Dreamcast games. Sure, it's not perfect. Later on in the arc, we get the tacked-on inclusion of the Deadly Six from Sonic Lost World, who effectively slam the brakes on this plot's momentum and turn it into something way more formulaic. Shadow sucks in this arc, and it only takes one scene to make his inclusion feel like a complete joke. Finally, Eggman's new comic original apprentice, Dr. Starline, or Starline, I don't know, goes through an arc of sorts that acts as a backwards deconstruction of the dynamic shared by, let's say, Sonic and Tails, and I think that would have been more interesting if more time were spent on it. The short and sweet of it is that Starline admires Eggman, but quickly begins to doubt him after the metal virus spreads far out of their control. It would have been nice to hold on to the vibes that Eggman had earlier in the arc and savor his master plan for just a little bit longer before it all fell apart. My apologies for the light spoiler, but this is a problem that has proven nearly impossible to solve across all media lately. Dr. Eggman is a goofy and comedic villain to such a degree that even when he pulls off something brilliant, it all comes crashing down way too quickly and way too easily. This is the greatest reason why I'd love to see the Sonic game series timeline receive a soft reboot, because after Eggman literally took over the world in Sonic Forces, what else could he possibly do within the games that would make me take him seriously as a villain. As for the comic, now that it's been handed off to Evan Stanley, the style of storytelling has shifted a bit into what feels more like an episodic structure. Based on what I've read, we're now seeing a more traditional approach with four-part stories that explore various aspects of Sonic's lore, like Chow Racing, for example. See, what did I tell you? That second-generation Sonic fan service, you love to see it. Although I might be a few issues behind at the time of this recording, I'm looking forward to seeing where the comic goes next from here, because it's proven that it holds up wonderfully in both the short term and the long term. Hopefully it's only a matter of time until my nitpicks are addressed and we get some proper attention given to Tails and Knuckles as well as the embarrassing flanderization of Shadow's character. Breathe some new life into these guys, I don't want them to become stagnant or, in Shadow's case, actively regress backwards. Even as it stands now, though, this is the kind of ongoing Sonic story I wish I had as a kid, instead of Ken Pender's infamous Archie run and that god-awful Sonic X adaptation. IDW Sonic is a treat for fans of the games both young and old, but especially old. The creators of this book clearly have a reverence for games like Sonic Adventure, Sonic Heroes, and Sonic Battle. It's the kind of second-gen Sonic representation I just love to see, especially when it's genuinely good and not, you know, Sonic Forces. Here's hoping that the cutscenes and upcoming Sonic games are just as fun, if not more so, than what's on display here. Speaking of the games, it would be a dream come true for me to see Ian Flynn or a similarly skilled writer reimagine the story of Sonic's game universe before the events of the main book, perhaps in a prequel or spin-off series. This would mean adapting Sonic 1 or Sonic Adventure all the way up to Sonic Forces in whatever 
creative way the author decides. Considering just how important storytelling is to Sonic fans, I think his previous narratives deserve to be retold as a linear, coherent, epic tale that leads right into the events of the regular series, but also stands out on its own. I know, that is a huge request, and I don't expect it to actually happen, but I sure would love it. It also goes without saying that I'd have a lot of fun reading comic versions of whatever new Sonic games are released while the series is still in publication. You know, I think I'm aiming a bit too high at this point, so let's just wrap this up. Just like with Sonic Mania, the various animations on Sonic's social media, and the incredible Sonic Symphony, this is a perfect reminder of just how many skilled and passionate people are currently working on Sonic content. Don't let that shitty Sonic Colors remaster fool you, Sonic is in a good spot right now, at least when it comes to multimedia. It eases my mind a bit to know that there's still something out there for me, and if this is the kind of Sonic content you like, then I urge you, get out there and read IDW Sonic the Hedgehog, buy it for real, spend money on it. Show the people who make it and the people who license it that it's something worthwhile and enjoyable. I know it's not a game, but please, anything to shake up the conversation about Sonic beyond just the same three talking points. I promise you, there's more to discuss than our super safe opinions on the same set of video games all the time, some of which don't even exist yet. As for me, now that I've for some reason made the decision to start making videos again, I hope to shed some light on some relatively underrepresented Sonic topics out there, and other media in general that I enjoy, I just want to talk about cool shit that I like. And I hope that you'll stick around to hear it, I don't really know where things go from here, I don't really have a plan other than to just say what I want to say when I feel like saying it on this platform. I'm still working full time as an artist and animator, but even so, I couldn't be kept away from doing this. I enjoy speaking my mind about the things that I love, especially this silly little video game multimedia thing that I've been such a big fan of since I was seven years old. It still inspires me, you know? It still hits me where I live. I thought I was done with this, but I'm not. I'm not done with this. I'm, I'm gonna keep making videos. But as for now, that about does it for me. I hope you enjoyed listening to this grown-ass man ramble for like 20 minutes about entertainment for kids. Not sure what I'll discuss next, but I guess you're free to give suggestions below. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to go be a well-adjusted grown-up and drive to my local Target store to buy duplicates for my Sonic action figure collection.